Judas was not saved. I repeat, Judas was not saved. Judas was never saved. Last night as I was doing some work, I found myself listening in on a debate over one saved, always saved. I won't go into all the merits of it. I won't even speak about who it was. Needless to say that the person that was on the side of uh, losing their salvation was incorrect. One of the things that was brought up for his point was that Judas was saved and lost his salvation. And, and I'm sitting there thinking, wait a second, how do we come to that conclusion? Well, the reason why they come to that conclusion is one, because of reading a text out of context, not understanding what's being stated and why this person's there. So let's go to where I picked up in the discussion. Listen to them. This was in John six and let's start somewhere around. Let's start, let's, you know, let's start in 64. No, let's start in 63. It is the spirit who gives life to the flesh profits, nothing. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life, but there are some of you who do not believe. Now notice what he says. There are some of you who are not, who do not believe, who are not believing for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were, who did not believe and who it was that would betray him. Now he seems to equate the one who would betray him with also the ones who do not believe. He knew who would betray him. Now let's go look at this for a second. He knew, uh, let's back up for Jesus knew that he's art. Now obviously he's God. So he knows ahead of time. What's going to be stated later might, I can see where it could cause somebody some problems, but we need to look at this closely. It should not cause anyone any problems, but I, but he knows who from the beginning, who didn't believe, uh, similarly, who would betray him. And he was saying, for this reason, I've said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted from the father. So now he's making a, uh, a salvific statement that coming to him is to be granted by the father. Well, the same one that would betray him are the same ones that hadn't believed would be the same ones that have not been granted by the father to come to him. But I digress on that point. Let's continue. As a result of this, many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. So Jesus said to the 12. Now, notice these are people that were walking with him. Is he saying that these people were once saved and lost it? No, he's not. Because if they walked away, he makes statements that they just can't get their hand head around revealing where their heart is after all, not with him. So verse 67, so Jesus said to the 12, do not, do you not want to go away also? Simon Peter answered to him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Jesus answered them, did I not myself choose you? Well, that might seem to bode you know, bode well for, for Judas. Jesus saying, did I not choose you? So what did Jesus choose him? The question is, choose for what? All 12 were cho were chosen to do something specifically. And I think that all 12 were chosen what they were chosen for, they did. But it shouldn't be taken that all 12 were chosen to be saved. We know that for a fact because of what he prays later on. We'll get to that in a second. But uh, did I not choose uh, myself, you, the 12, and yet one of you uh, is a devil. Now he's speaking right now. How do we know so? Because he uses the word estin. This is present active indicative. So this word estin means that right now this person is a devil. Now he meant Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the 12, was going to betray him. Now he had, it hadn't happened yet. Notice what he calls him at the moment. He calls him a devil at that moment. But then he also says he knows of who he has chosen. Now, if we were to take this that Jesus mean, meant that he chose Judas for salvation as well, we've got a couple problems. One, in John 17, look what he says. Jesus is praying and he said, Father, hours come, glorify your son, that your son may glorify you, even as you have given him authority over all flesh. He says, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Now, he says, speaks about how he has glorified him. Now, give him back the glory that he had with him before. Look what he says in verse six. I have manifest your name to the men whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours and you gave them to me and they have kept your word. Well, implying what? Maybe that one of them didn't because we know one of them did not. Uh, no, uh, now they have come to know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words which you gave me, I have given to them and they received them and truly understood that I came forth from you and they believed that you sent me. Uh, so notice what he's saying now. 
He said, they believe that you sent me. And then let's continue. I ask on their behalf. I do not ask on behalf of the world, but of those whom you have given me, for they are yours. Remember that, what he's saying. For those that you, Father, have given me the Son. Remember that. Who gave who to who? For those that you have given me, and all things are mine, all things are uh, are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. I am no longer in the world, and yet they themselves are in the world. And I come to you, Holy Father, keep them in your name, the name which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I was keeping them in your name, which you have given me, and I guarded them, and not one of them perished, but the son of perdition. So now is he saying that the son of perdition was one of the ones that he was giving them? Or is he distinguishing the son of perdition from the other 11 so that the scripture would be fulfilled? What scripture would be fulfilled? That's pretty end. We, we need to figure that out. But now I come to you and these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy and my and made full in themselves. I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of this world, even as I am of the world. So now. He's speaking about them. Jesus is praying for them. Is he distinguishing them from Judas or he's saying Judas is part of it? Because that, that would make the whole thing kind of odd to say that he's not lost any of them. Oh, by the way, where does this come from? Him not losing any of them. Well, that comes from John chapter six. So if all of these the ones that he has given them, he hadn't lose one, lost one except for Judas. It makes this statement here incorrect then. All that the Father has given me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out, for I have come down from heaven to do not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is his will, that all that he has given me I should lose nothing but raise him in the last day. Well, this obviously has to include, it's not just, I don't think just the apostles, the, the disciples, but also mankind, but it naturally has to include the disciples. If that is to include Judas, we got a big problem. The problem is then Jesus is incorrect. In the in the garden, he says that he that the only one that was lost is Judas. And if he meant that to be all all of the ones that were given that were saved, well, then that cannot be correct, because now we have an, a, an, a truly contradictory statement here in verse 39. It says all that you have given, me, I will not lose one. So how then could he lose any? He can't lose any. So he's not referring to him. But by the way, what makes this even more uh, clear is what Jesus himself says about Judas. Let's look at that. In John 13, verse 10, Jesus said to him, this is where he's going to wash their feet. He said to him, he who has bathed needs only to uh, to wash his feet, um, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. Now, when he says to be clean, how is he saying this? For he knew of the one who's betraying him for this reason. He said, not all of you are clean. Now, this word clean uh, obviously he's speaking about in relation to their heart and their standing. Well, we got a question here. We have a huge glaring issue here that needs to be addressed. So when we look at this Greek word here, the word is leluinas, which is bathe in the English, but the Greek tense sheds a little more light on it. It is a perfect tense. The a perfect tense in Greek is a completed action from the past. So here this word is saying that he who has already been bathed, so these disciples, all of them have been bathed, except for who? Judas. So he's making a statement about the condition of this person, how they stand. They stand pure. They stand clean. They have been done that way in the past, but not Judas. So you cannot come back and say that Judas at one point in time was. Jesus is saying they, he has not been. He says for verse 11, for he knew the ones, the one who was betraying him. For this reason, he said, not all of you are clean. So all of the rest were clean, have been clean from the past, except for Judas. Now, I want to go back to this verse uh, in chapter six. He says, Jesus answered, I did I not myself choose you, the 12, and yet one of you is a devil. Remember, I said I want to focus on this word is a devil. This Greek word right here, esteem, present active tense. At this point in time, Judas had not had Satan enter him. But Jesus is making a statement about him at this time that you are a devil. Then later on, Satan enters him. This is in, go to, I'm sorry, go to uh, Luke 2 and 22 and 3. And Satan entered into Judas, who was called Iscariot, belonging to the number of the 12. And he went away and discussed with the chief priests and officers how he might betray him. So when Jesus makes a statement that uh, you are a devil, 
This was prior to Satan entering him. This is prior to him being possessed. This is prior to him being the word demonized. This is prior to this happening. So Jesus is stating what he is. Now, has, has Judas always been that case? Judas has always been that way. As a matter of fact, it was prophesied about, Ju about Judas. Let's go to Acts 1, and this is where they are replacing Judas. They're going to draw straws and draw straws. They're going to cast lots for, for Judas, and the Lord is going to choose. But notice what it's stating first. He says, and it became known to all who were living in Jerusalem so that in their own language, the field was called Habakkuk. Uh, that is the field of blood. That's where he goes and he dies and he's there. This field is purchased with that 30 pieces of silver. And notice what it says. Verse 24, it is written in the book of Psalms, let his homestead be made desolate and let no one dwell in it. And what else does it say in Psalms? Let another take his office. Well, it would be helpful to go back and look at Psalms and see where this where this is spoken of, this prophecy. Prophetically speaking of this one that's going to take his place, notice what this person with the prophecy about Judas is. Before Judas is born, this, this is the adjective. This is the description of Judas even before he's born. We can't come away thinking that Judas ever was saved. He says, appoint a wicked man over him. And let an accuser stand at his right hand. When he is judged, let him come forth guilty and let his prayer become sin. Let his days be few. Let another take his office. This is speaking about Judas. Called him a wicked man. His prayer will be sin. He will be judged. Uh, come forth guilty. He's an accuser. And so Judas is never described as a believer, though he was numbered amongst the believers though he was with them, kind of like what First John is speaking of, he was numbered amongst them, but he was never really one of them, or else he never would have came out from among them. But it was clear who he was, and Jesus knew who he was. And so why was Judas there? Well, to fulfill um, this, pro this prophecy. And so to come back and say Judas was ever saved, how? What Whatever made Judas saved? Did Judas at least appear to be a follower? Sure, anyone can appear to be a follower. That can be done easily. But we notice and recognize who he is. His heart was always set to betray. His always his heart was always set after money, after his own things. And so he was never one just because he looked like one. And I would wish that people would stop trying to say or use Judas as an example of a Christian who fell away. Because no one would ever call a person who acts like Judas, who thinks like Judas, who moves like Judas. No one would ever call that person a Christian. And so I think you do a disservice to the term, to the word, to the body, to the group, to the sheep, to the family, if you call someone or if you say that Judas is a Christian. No, that means that anyone can be a Christian. Just because he was numbered, just because he walked around, just because he even looked like it, and just because even some of the other disciples may have been fooled, obviously the Lord wasn't. He's the one that makes you saved. He never had the, the notion that Judas was saved. And so we need to stop with this. It's a preposterous statement to ever say that Judas was ever once saved. If he was saved, when did he become saved? That's a question. When did he become saved? How did he become saved? There's just no statement behind it at all. Amen.